World-renowned coral scientists have slammed the response to the mass coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. The federal government has rejected claims it's been slow to act, insisting it's doing all it can to help. Hey guys, how are you? This is uh, Richard from the Aficionado channel and Beast.com and I am extremely hum humbled and honored to be here in the presence of the godfather of the corals, Charlie Barron. How are you, sir? I'm good. Yep. <laughs> how are you enjoying the show so far? It's been most interesting, yes. Really? Yes. This is the uh, fourth time I've been to a Magna. Uh, I, I, I come to these meetings because I believe that it's so important for the future of corals. Isn't it? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Why do you feel that it's so important for corals? Well, they're going to go extinct in the wild at a very great rate. And uh, it's like keeping animals in zoos that have gone extinct in the wild, yes. or going extinct in the wild. Um, you kept in zoos, maybe you can repopulate from them, or maybe just keep them going in, the, in, in zoos because they're not found anywhere else. And I think the in the in the in the future, um, in the next 50 years, this is going to become critically important to keeping a lot of corals in existence. Right. So you think that um, us hobbyists will have will have a great role to play in conserving all these corals? Well, they already have. Um, lots of science is now based around Aquaria, um, my own institute. Um, they have a huge building now. A very elaborate aquaria, aquarium systems doing experiments. Um, it means keeping corals alive, breeding them, so on, cross-breeding them. Uh, that's all from the technology that was developed by the aquarium industry. That's fascinating to learn. It's yeah. very important that people know this. Yes, yes. Wow. I, I actually didn't, didn't even know this until you, you brought this up. <laughs> well, I, kept, I tried to keep corals alive in my aquarium. They all died because I didn't know any of this technology. Gotcha. And then uh, yeah. I found out. You know, uh, what, what always interested me was, you know, you're the first one to say, hey, listen, you guys, the corals are dying. And um, at that time, you know, like Australian universities and stuff like that, they 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 were um, saying that it wasn't. And, but you kind of like you know, whistle blowed on it and say, look, this this is contradicting. Corals are dying. You saw things happening. You know, what prompted you to, to go against it, like rise against that? I think, like everybody else, when I first heard about climate change and that came from uh, in the 1980s and I thought this is ridiculous. I was as skeptical as can be. But unlike most people I dive into books and into the science. It took me a week to realize wow this is real. And then uh, came the notion that uh, corals would be very vulnerable to climate change and climate to, uh, and to uh, change in the chemistry of the oceans. And so more and more I realized that um, if I was going to be useful to this world, I had to get up and start talking. And so I did. That's awesome. Have you faced any um, harsh, like any kind of like a, a trouble uh, when, you, when you made this <laughs> Trouble. <laughs> uh, it's more than trouble, yes. Oh yes, lots, yes. yes. I, would, I would imagine all the scholars and you know, every, everybody was trying to like, you know, just say, like, oh, this is not true, you're going against science. What I've always done is uh -huh. I haven't had a personal opinion, I've just said what the science says. What I did do though, was take the trouble to find out what the science says. And uh, I, with my family, I lived for a year and a half in a retreat in France, where I just studied, and I studied more than I've ever done for a university degree, all the ramifications of carbon dioxide and what it could do, from the geology to the genetics to the physics to the, all these different aspects. And it took a long time to stitch it all together. Uh, and that's what I did. And so it's, I came out of that study angry about the skeptics that were always on television and wanting to rebuff what they said because I realized how serious the whole thing was. Right, because you know, it's, it's always the, the, the uneducated or whatever, they're always loud in your face, you know, and then always the, 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 the science, the facts, and they're always just, you know, always in the back, you know? It's, it's, it's something that's very frustrating at times. Well, yes, and I said amongst many other things that the 
earlier international intergovernmental panel of climate change, IPCC, were wrong. And they were wrong. And they were wrong. And uh, though, although individual scientists weren't, uh, the way it was all put together was very political and it was misleading the world. Uh, that's no longer happening, uh, but it, it held the world back for a long time. And so when I said there will be 400 parts per million carbon dioxide by 2015, um, a lot of scientists said, look, stop saying things like that. It's just not true. We had 400 parts per million in 2015. And the reason I knew all that was that I got hold of all the earlier research that was funded by the oil industry. And they turned it all over to me. Right. They were right. Yeah, I, and I, I followed what they said. I remember reading about that, uh, I think, from Google Exxon or something, that they had some research on the early. Oh, huge amount. Yeah. Yeah, for their own selfish wow. needs. Yeah. And it duped a lot of scientists. Yeah. They thought Exxon was doing this out of lab. Yeah. yeah. They weren't. <laughs> So, you know, I was talking to you yesterday and you were telling me you still dive to this day. Oh yes, I've just signed up for a, um, I'm going on a trip to one of my favorite places in the Great Barrier Reef in Very a month's nice. time. Yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. Now, tell me, you found there's so many, uh, so many species of corals. What is the one that, that stands out to you? Do you have any memorable ones that, that, you, uh, that has a special place for you? Any coral? Uh, I have a lot. Um, uh, it, it changes. Um, well, what changes is that I haven't seen a coral for a long time, perhaps, and I find it somewhere. I think, oh, it's not extinct. So some of these are very well known here. They're, they're sold here. Uh, but um, I was thinking they'd gone extinct on the Great Barrier Reef, and so it's What's good for me is finding something I thought was, was going regionally extinct, and that's exciting. And of course, I want that coral to be moved, uh, bits of that coral to be raised in aquaria, where it can be at uh, least preserved alive, in a live state. That's the exciting part for me. It's actually totally different perspective coming from you know like someone like you, you know, who's been doing this for so long, you know. Well, I know every coral. Yeah, they're like my family, they're personal. Yeah. And if I find, I believe they have been wiped out. It's nice to find a cousin here. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, my children, if you like. What do you think, uh, what can we do to, uh, as a hobbyist or as a people, what can we do to help conserve uh, our ocean? I think what we, what we must do is connect a hobbyist more with scientists, and that is happening. Um, now that's happened elsewhere in other things, like if you get your bird guide in Europe or England or, or perhaps in the States also, um, that bird guide won't have been written by an ornithologist or the information of it. It comes from bird watchers, and that's what's happening in the oceans now. We have six million people diving on coral reefs. And if those six million people, or even a small fraction of them, uh, understand or know what they're looking at uh, and what's not there, what's changed, um, then that is a that is huge input into science. Um, so from this meeting, I've had just dozens of people telling me things something I didn't know. I wish I could capture it all because it's not known to science. So that's the hobbyist sees all this and they, they see it because they can do things in aquaria that we never dreamt of in the wild, of course. How would you suggest that we, we connect with scientists? How, like, you know, I don't think that would be an easy thing to do. Well, um, I do think our website, Corals of the World, will be doing just that. Is that right? Yes, I'm thinking um, um, we should have a module in that website uh, dedicated to uh, the, what corals look like in aquarium because they don't look like they do in the wild. And there's lots of reasons for that and they're very interesting reasons. Um, and it's the aquarius that knows why some coral is different. They'll know why uh, a species, or I say it's a species in Fiji, looks different from a dozen the Great Barrier Reef. Is it a species? Can they interbreed? Uh, the aquarius could find these things out and uh, they're doing it all the time. Yeah. And so I'm hearing all sorts of things that science doesn't know about. Um, that's going to 
uh, we would deal with that on the website hopefully. Um, but websites are expensive and it's hard to get money to do this. But um, that's, that's always been my aim. Um, there's no such thing as a scientist who's separate from a naturalist, um, who's separate from people who are just really interested. Um, and so with corals as with birds, you get people that watch and think and, and learn and that's where you get information captured. Have you had a chance to check out some of the work from Jamie Craig from um, Horniman Museum? From? From Horniman Museum in England, um, where they had the coral, uh, um, coral breeding program, where they, where they... Oh, I've seen lots of coral breeding programs. Like, yeah, they had to, where they um, catch the eggs and eggs and sperm and uh, mix the breeds oh, yes. from different, different regions of the oh, coral. Oh, that's going on everywhere now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's doing it a lot. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about Japan, that? In Japan, all over uh, Australia. Um, in universities um, in America, mm -hmm. um, in, in all sorts of unlucky places, yeah. they're doing it. And I know one study in Japan has um, taken uh, corals through um, three generations yeah. of interbreeding different species. Right. And what do you what do you think about that right now? Is that's very interesting. It's very um, exciting to me. <laughs> well. Um, corals like most things yeah we talk about species but actually for most marine life especially mm -hmm. species don't exist uh, one merges into another yeah and they form these interlocking patterns because the genes are moved around by ocean currents right and so everything we say about a species is to some extent wrong because it might apply to one place but doesn't apply to what the likes of me says the same species in another place mm -hmm. but is it the same species mm -hmm. or is it got some bit more of some other species into it yeah. to make it different got and that's why the whole thing is a very very complex yeah. uh, setup where we've got to put names on things yeah. but those names have got to be taken with a, a pinch of salt gotcha yeah. that's very interesting sea salt <laughs> <laughs> obviously i'm very keen on obvious <laughs> And uh, no, I, I think it's um, it's so wrong when um, for uh, puritanical reasons people want to shut down uh, collecting corals in the wild. It does no damage at all. It just uh, is, it, it, these are absurd things, and they're, in the, they're so potentially damaging in the longer term. We need reef aquaria to interest children, young people, because young people become interested adults, the interested adults are going to save this whole thing, uh, but we need aquaria for science, we need aquaria for so many things, and we need to populate these aquaria from, uh, if I had my way, we'd have a, an aquarium in every school on the planet, mm. yeah, that's and it would do no harm um, whatsoever to the I wild. In my office on a college campus. It's great, and how many people have seen that? Yeah, yeah. Thousands. Yeah, thousands. Yeah. And they, get, they become interested. And they won't want politicians to do things that would, would destroy that. Yeah. Exactly. Good. Yeah. So what do you think about, um, like you, you, you touched on it briefly, but the science is saying that well, how, we, you know, like how we do the hobby and how we collect from the wild is, um, is sustainable, right? Yes. Like, so your opinion on it is, uh, on the wild collection is, because, lo because it is very sustainable, we, we are, you're encouraging this and you're, you're okay with the wild collection as of now, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you see where, where ships anchor mm -hmm. and the anchor swings around over a great massive coral. Yeah. I mean, how many aquariums worth of coral yeah. does that wipe out in one anchor? Uh, it, yeah. It's just the, the, what I guess the argument is that um, people will collect rare corals, mm -hmm. but it's become important to collect rare corals, mm -hmm. uh, to get those corals into aquaria to study and to observe and to keep going. Mm -hmm. And I don't see there's any rational argument otherwise. Um, I wouldn't be in favor of collecting corals in, in, a, in a totally uncontrolled way, mm -hmm. but it is really easy to regulate yeah. uh, collecting so that there is no uh, impact on natural populations. In countries, I mean, Indonesia it is, it is ridiculous to, to limit collecting of corals. Uh, they have billions upon billions of corals all over the place, and these are 
um, one season of bleaching um, will wipe out more corals than the, the collecting of corals for all time. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it is an it is a no-brainer, uh, and it is silly that people think they're doing good by banning collecting of corals in the wild. Yeah. Um, sometimes it needs some regulation if they're rare things, um, but that's easily done. Yeah. And if you, but if it's not done, they're just going to go extinct. Yeah. And we won't know even if they once existed hardly. And so my Corals of the World website will become corals that used to be on the World website. And it's very, very serious. All right, guys, uh, thank you for joining us. We had a just amazing conversation with the Charlie Baron. Um, you know, like, hear his story. Um, I'm going to link the website here, so be sure to check, him, check his out, uh, stories out. And just do what we can. Know that we make a difference and, and just, just connect with the scientists and do whatever we can possible to conserve these, these beautiful creatures that we love and for our future generations. Thank you so much, Charlie, for, for joining us and allowing us to interview you on this, this wonderful day in Magna. And I hope you enjoyed this weekend. That's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think there's going to be any problem uh, in the future of moving information from the aquarium to the reef scientists. Yeah. Have you actually had... Uh, huh? Your mic's on the floor. Oh, it dropped. When did it drop? Uh, it's okay. He's fine. Yeah, that's fine. We can hear him. We can hear you. Okay. Well, that's fine. I don't know how long. No, 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 that's fine. Because uh, the thing is, I could, I could, of the time you talk, I could still hear you. Yeah. So what I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dub it. You can, you can yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dub it and I'm gonna dub the question. So it's, it's fine. Okay. okay.